Aaron Costello, Black Hills Energy. I manage the South Dakota Governmental Affairs. Thanks for being here today. Um, I'm really excited to welcome you to this Cracker Barrel event. Uh, Western Dakota Tech has generously uh, donated the facility. I just lost my notes. Today is only going to get better from here. Uh, Western Dakota Tech has generously welcomed us to uh, their space to hold this forum. And we've coordinated a live stream. And there's the ability to ask questions or submit questions remotely for the Cracker Barrels. You can find a link for that live stream on elevaterapidcity.com or through the Elevate Rapid City Facebook page. And uh, a reminder for the legislators, since this is live streamed, please do speak into the microphone so that everyone can hear. Uh, the guidelines for today's question and answer format are for in-person attendees to submit their questions written on the forms provided in the back. And you can get this form from one of our volunteers who are around the room. Can all of our volunteers please raise their hands? We've got Haven. Haven is our lone vol volunteer today. Uh, that, that will be picking up questions. So Haven stuck. I'd also like to thank uh, Len Kindle, Brad Satoff, Ann Brettlinger, and uh, Andy Greenman for volunteering your time here in the back. So these written questions will allow us to group similar questions so we can address more topics. And you'll see on the forum that we ask for your name. And this is optional, however, when possible, we do like to announce who is asking the question. And please write legibly. Uh, we do have the ability to decipher some code, uh, but we prefer to spend our time grouping the questions. And um, please keep your questions respectful. Uh, we, will be, uh, we, we will be vetting the questions based on content if we think something is a bit out of line, uh, we will not raise that question for our legislators. To ensure we cover as many audience questions as we can, we ask that only a maximum of four legislators address each question and to keep your response to two to three minutes. And is at the front of the room, right in front of the podium with a timer. Uh, please wrap up your remarks when you see the yellow light turn on. And um, I do have a microphone and my voice can get a lot louder and deeper than this if um, we need to. Uh, just move things along. Before we get to the questions, again, I want to thank Western Dakota Tech and their team for the use of this Cracker Barrel, uh, for the event, the use of this event facility for the Cracker Barrel. And uh, I'd like to inv invite Dr. Ann Bowman, the president of Western Dakota Technical College, to come up and offer a few words of welcome. Good morning, everybody. I am, I kind of like that we're now Western Dakota Tech Cracker Barrel. That's awesome. Um, I just really appreciate our legislators for coming out this morning. I realize that it isn't our typical Western Dakota Tech awesome weather out here today. So, and I know it's also the middle of the, se the session and that we're getting to the point where there's just a lot of busy stuff happening. So I appreciate all of the work that you do and all of the time that you're taking this morning out of your time to come out here and meet with everybody. Um, it's super important for um, a democracy um, to be able to ask questions of their representatives and to be able to have some um, positive, awesome discussions about the issues of the day. So welcome to Western Dakota Tech, and I hope that everybody has a, a great time with the Cracker Barrel this morning. Thank you. Yep. We also have a number of current and former elected officials and the audience today, if you wouldn't mind standing so we could recognize the sacrifices that you make to try and better our community and our state. And of course, the audience, thank you for being here. This wouldn't be a forum if it weren't for you all. So thanks for braving the roads, for arriving here safely. and. Um, one thing I want to touch on before I introduce the legislators is someone pointed out there's a potential trip hazard right here. So if you do find yourself walking between the lights and the stage, just please be mindful that there's a cord here. And also for our legislators, there are two cords here. 
So um, avoid the trip hazard, please. Um, okay, so on behalf of the Rapid City Area Community and Elevate, I want to recognize these legislators for their hard work for the great state of South Dakota and for sharing part of their Saturday with us today. Starting on the far right, we have Representative Chris Johnson. With, pardon? The far right. The far <laughs> you said it, not me. In the middle, we have Representative Jess Olson. And then on my right, also Representative Tim Goodwin. And on the far left, literally, we have <laughs> Senator Mike Diedrich, we have Senator David Johnson, Representative Mike Derby, and Senator Helene Duhamel. Can we all please just give a hand for them attending? <laughs> At the beginning of every Cracker Barrel, we give some legislators the opportunity to give remarks. And today, providing remarks will be Mike Derby and Senator Helene Duhamel. Um, we did have Representative Tony Randolph on the list, uh, but unfortunately he is sick, sick today and send, sends his regrets that he was not able to attend. So um, I'll introduce Representative Mike Derby of District 34. Good morning. Uh, Mike Derby, State Representative, District 34. Uh, I'd like to thank Elevate and Western Dakota Tech for uh, hosting this today, and I really appreciate everybody that came out today. A um, little background on myself. Uh, our family moved to Rapid City in 1965. I grew up, went to Meadowbrook grade school and West Junior High back when they were junior highs and Stevens High School. So I've lived, lived uh, my entire time in Rapid City in District 34, and it's um, my wife Carmen and I have been married 38 years. I've got two daughters, I'm married, two granddaughters, so um, I'm a girl dad and very proud of it. It's been an honor to serve you, and uh, I am running for re-election in District 34 House, and one of the things that I do, how many of you have been to Pier in the Capitol? All right, one of the, we have one of the most impressive state capitals in the country. And for years, I'd always park in the back and wander in and go up the back stairway and go, to, go there. And so recently, I've, I've been coming in and walking up to start my day, walking up the grand staircase. And I mean, you really get the feeling that you're there in a special place. And so that's how I start my day is doing that. Um, I brought a little prop today. This is a block of wood, and one of the things I've learned a few years ago was David Lust, our former majority leader and a good friend of ours that passed away recently, uh, he would start the session out when he was majority leader with a block of wood, and he said, every legislator comes in with a block of wood, and as you're moving through the process, you start whittling on that block of wood. If you say something negative, if you stab somebody in the back, if you lie, if you don't do the right thing, if you're there for the wrong reasons, you're whittling, you're whittling and whittling that block of wood. And I'm not perfect, I catch myself falling into some of those situations, but at the end of the session, with your block of wood, if you whittle it down to this, you don't have much. When you really need people to help you out at the end of the session and all you've got is a toothpick, it doesn't work. So I, I think of that all the time when I'm in peer and try to abide by that. Um, speaking of humbling things, this, uh, we have a legislative service every year for legislators that have passed away and David Lust was honored this year. There were 13 legislators in there and I went through the list and realized I either served with or knew seven out of the 13 legislators. And so one of these days, all of us, there's going to be a service and a rose is going to pass from the front of the house floor from the right to the left, signifying that we passed away. And you know, when you see things like that, it really makes you be proud you're there. You want to do the right thing. 
Um, and that's a big deal. Next year, I hope that uh, Rapid City, we had a Rapid City Day, and next year it was canceled this year. And I really hope next year we can have a robust Rapid City Day on the Capitol uh, Rotunda floor. We need you to come out. It's very impressive. We love having people out from Rapid City. It gives you that time to talk to people and uh, your legislators and get the feel for what's going on. So next year, I challenge you to get on the bus or do whatever we do and, and come out for Rapid City Day. Last Cracker Barrel, um, I was very impressed with Senator Johnson ticked off the list of all the budget hearings. Remember that? And that list went on and on and on. And, and I thought, well, I'm going to share some fun facts with you today. Um, this is a 37-day session. We just finished day 21, and we have a veto day. Um, so we're more than halfway through the session. And uh, we introduced 551 bills which is the most bills introduced since 1997. So it's the most number of bills in 25 years. We, the House introduced 339, and the Senate introduced 212. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is we had a little bit of a kerfuffle this week, if you follow that. Maybe some of you don't know what a kerfuffle is, but it's K-E-R, fuffle. And it means, and it means uh, especially uh, commotion or fuss, especially one caused by conflicting views. And so we had a kerfuffle, but we did get the daycare dollars out the door. Um, proud of that. And the last thing I'd like to say is a quote um, from Tom Johnson's dad. If you've heard this quote, um, there's two types of people, those that are humble and those that are about to be humble. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. And before we move on to uh, Senator Duhamel, I would like to recognize the arrival of Senator Julie Fry Mueller for District 30. So, Senator Mueller, Fry Mueller, thanks for being here today. Right. Helene, go ahead. Thank you, Aaron. Helene Duhamel, Senator District 32 in Rapid City. I'm in my third session and enjoying my experience again very much. Water, workforce housing, and wages. The three W's that I'm really concentrating on this year, trying to make a difference in the people, the lives of people in South Dakota. First, water. I don't know if you've been paying attention, but we were given a lot of money specifically for this use from Washington, D.C. So our goal is to spend this in the best way possible that will have impact for generations to come. So this is when we jumped on the idea of moving Missouri River water all the way into Western Dakota, into every community that has needs for the future. We are relying on a study from the School of Mines and Technology that shows a need already with a couple of years of drought. So we think this is very important. About 25 years ago, Lewis and Clark was started going east, went downhill through farmland, through the big population centers to other states they're still working on Lewis and Clark. So the time to get started for us is now. We are growing every community in this part of the state, in particular Pine Ridge, the Black Hills communities, we're all suffering from water shortages. We all work from the Madison Aquifer. It does not recharge fast enough. We have some 350 straws into that aquifer and we put in more every day with every new development. So we need a comprehensive regional water plan and we think this is the start. A big transformational project with impact for generations to come. Workforce housing, we have negotiated successfully with the executive branch and have a proposal for two pots of money, one for the grant money from the federal government that has to be given out in a small time frame, another pot revolving loan fund to make sure that it impacts every community in the state, and we're talking here infrastructure. We're trying to get more affordable housing for the workforce. In particular, Rapid City has identified multifamily homes as our target. So we think that that will be a good impact. And then the governor recommended a 3% increase in the big three. Uh, I can speak uh, for the Senate that there's strong support for that. That would be um, incentives for keeping teacher pay, uh, state employees and healthcare providers, 6% increase. Uh, 
I will say that given all the spending that we have, and much of that is out of our hands but with the federal government, I fear in a very few years we could be in uh, trouble financially. So I have a sheet on sustainability. I'd be glad to give anybody afterward if you have some interest. But you look at going forward what we are baking into the system and our obligations. Uh, we've seen growth the past couple of years phenomenal in South Dakota, but our average growth is less than 2%. If we go back into that, we have to be careful. Inflation is a big concern looming on the horizon and even now. Federal policy, more spending. The South Dakota challenges we have, drought, uh, fertilizer expenses, Medicaid expansion that is uh, doing very well in the polling and that'll be on the ballot next year. The federal prison system. We think that we're going to have to build a new penitentiary that is overcrowded and not ADA compliant. And then South Dakota fiscal responsibility. So we have some looming concerns in the not too distant future. So I think we need to be very careful. I think we're doing the right thing, saving as much money as we can. I think we need to do more of that. It remains my great honor to serve in the State Senate, and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Senator Duhamel. Uh, we will now open up for questions from the audience. If you had not had a chance to fill out a question form, please get one from the back of the room near the drink station or uh, ask one of our volunteers uh, for one. Um, our first question, uh, there are four questions addressing House Bill 1337 to protect elementary and secondary students from political indoctrination. How can something like slavery be taught in an objective manner, and how does this bill affect free speech? Again, as you approach, uh, please keep your eye on the lights, and we will have, uh, allow three to four responses. Thank you for the question. I'm, I'm Representative Chris Johnson from District 32. Uh, I address this question, the last Cracker Barrel. I also address it, and you can look back on uh, Thursday's press conference, which I participated in on behalf of the House. Uh, it, we had a, quite an exchange on this question. We're talking about critical race theory here. And, um, you know, the premise of the question is saying that we don't have objective discussions on negative things that have happened in our history. Uh, we have had that ever since I was a kid. When I was a kid, I went to school. We learned about the Trail of Tears. We learned about slavery. We learned about the Whiskey Rebellion. We learned about uh, injustices done to natives and others in this country. And you know, uh, this country was based on a principle of struggling with those injustices and creating a system of government under which people who disagree, who disagree with each other can coexist peacefully. And you know, I'm happy to say that we've existed for well over 200 years that way, and we do a better job than any nation on the face of the earth when it comes to living together with people we do disagree with peacefully. The, the critical race theory strikes the assumption that because I, if I'm white, and if I'm uh, Christian, and if I'm male, and if I come from a two-parent household, that by my nature, by nature of what I am, I'm already an oppressor, and I'm racist. That's simply wrong. You know, I, I believe in having a level playing field saying everyone is equal before the discussion takes place. That's what I support. And I support uh, showing patriotism to this great country. You know, one of the things I brought up in the, cracker, in the uh, press conference was this. People are taking a knee all across America right now in protest of what our flag. What does our flag represent? Our flag represents the Constitution of the United States of America. The Constitution that gives each American the right to protest, to take a knee. And when people take a knee to protest the very symbol of their right to protest, that's ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. I don't know why we have this argument. Let's come together as Americans and, and start the conversation as we always have with a level playing field. Good morning, Jess Olson, District 34. Um, I wanted, to, I'm not on the Education Committee. I used to be on the Education Committee, but I had the opportunity to sit in this, uh, into their committee hearing this week because I had another bill. So I wanted to, I think, 
Lynn has it up, and you can see the amended version. So I just wanted to kind of, oh, I'll get that closer. Thank you. Okay. So I wanted to kind of walk you through what I saw and observed in the committee just for your information. So if you go online as well, you can look at the amended version and what transpired during committee. The first section, which is an opinion, was struck from the bill that was introduced. This is not common. You shouldn't have opining in your bill. So that's section one. Um, and then the new section one has that information that I, I understand is, is divisive and can be concerning. But I think um, if you read through it, I think the title has been a little misleading, but the content is sort of, it was brought forward. It was discussed a lot. It was kind of, it was palatable to the committee. So I'm going to be thinking a lot on this before I vote on it on the floor, and I'd very much welcome people to email me about this. But the other part that I wanted to point out is um, section two. If you can scroll to section two. So the part that says, that was added uh, online, it's red, but nothing in this section prohibits a school district employee from discussing these, in, these topics. That's an important point that was added for clarification. And so I think for the teachers in the room, I come from a long line of teachers, that's an important protection for them in the classroom. And then sections four and five and six and seven were struck. So I would encourage you, I just wanted to talk you through what happened in committee and I would encourage you to read the new amended version that will come to the floor and then please email your representatives. Thank you. Thank you, representatives. Um, seeing no other legislators that can speak on this, we will move on to our next question. Um, this question is directed specifically towards uh, Representative Chris Johnson, and uh, but all legislators have an opportunity to respond. This question is on House Bill 1203. HB 1203 appears to be a bill that protects the South Dakota taxpayer by giving us a voice to stop rampant increases in property taxes. What is the status of this important bill since the tax committee meeting in Pier on Thursday? Thank you. Representative Chris Johnson, District 32 again. Thank you for the question and thank you for directing it towards me since I am the prime sponsor. Uh, Obviously, this bill was very divided in committee. I'm, I was sad to see that. I don't think it should be. Um, but it took <laughs> seven separate votes in committee before we had final disposition on this bill that brought it to the floor where we're going to try to get it calendared on Monday. Um, there are a lot of, there's a lot of misinformation out there about this bill. This bill is a transparency bill, pure and simple. This bill does not impose any restrictions on counties, on, district, on taxing districts, on anybody, to do what they continued, they have done for years in the past, which is to raise revenues as they see fit in order to get, deliver their operations. <clears throat> but, and in the interest of transparency, I do want to thank a uh, city of, or a county official here for giving me some of the talking points against this. First of all, it says, <clears throat> this was brought up in committee too, this is a program coming out of Kansas, not true. Uh, that was brought up in committee. I, uh, this com comes from taxpayers coming to me saying we need some relief. We have four bills going through the House right, or through the legislature right now trying to give tax relief. It's no secret that people feel like they're being overtaxed. Um, and I reached out to Kansas, who was a state that recently passed this. It's been passed in three states, and the Kansas Policy Institute was very willing to help me. They helped by doing a survey, spent $8,000 on a survey through Survey USA, <clears throat> and I have this in case anyone wants to see it, um, by a three to one margin. South Dakotans want this, taxpayers want this. This is not a bill that's us versus them. It says this is an unfunded mandate, not true. This mandate can be easily funded, in, 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 if you call it a mandate. It's a simple postcard that costs 50, 60 cents uh, to mail out to the taxpayer to let them know how much their taxes are going to go up before the decision is made to actually 
raise those taxes. It's not currently being done in South Dakota in that form. This gives that form some ability. We heard a testimony from somebody from a district that said their district had the practice of raising to, to the 3% or CPI limit plus growth every year and then putting it in a savings account. And ultimately, I believe they had $500,000 in a savings account. I would call that unmandated funding from the side of a taxpayer. So this just gives simple transparency before they make the decision to raise revenues. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Johnson. Yes. Good morning, Jess Olson again. Um, I serve on the tax committee and I, I believe some of the individuals who testified were there and I, I did receive your email. So I wanted to address some of the questions. So some of the process on this, we heard a lot of opposition testimony. Auditors from across the state called in. And what happens when, that, when, when we hear that kind of testimony, that flags for me that this bill is not ready for prime time. So I made a motion in committee to table it, which allows the sponsor to have time to continue to work on this and bring the parties together. Because I think there is a path forward. Do we all want transparency? Absolutely. And I work on bills like this that are complicated and you're trying to regulate things or change things and they're statewide and you want to bring all the parties together and come to some sort of an agreement so how you can move forward. So one of the questions I got asked was why didn't you comment? Well, when you make a tabling motion, which lays it on the table for us to lift off of the table at a later time, you cannot comment on that motion. So that was one of the pieces there. I did make the comment when there was another uh, motion to send it to the floor that it was not ready. Um, I would like there to be more work done on this, maybe bring it back next year in a form that's agreeable for everyone. Because of course we want to hold our government agencies accountable, but we want to do it in a way that also doesn't increase taxes. And what, what isn't brought up is that in those other states there are tax increases. And the other part that happens with this, this does not control your house evaluation continuing to go up. If you look up Kansas, they have an 8% increase. That will continue to go up, which will continue to drive your tax base up. So some of those concerns will not be addressed by this bill. But the transparency and the cost for counties can be addressed by technology. And I brought that up as well because I serve on local government and we, we get these questions a lot. How do we do government in a transparent way with transparent meetings, leverage technology to make it accessible and affordable for everybody? So I, I think we need to continue to do some work on that and I just wanted to point out some of the opposing views for why this isn't quite ready this year. Thanks. Thank you, Representative Olson. Our next question is in reference to the uh, initiated Major 26 and Amendment A, which are the, uh, which was legalizing medicinal and recreational marijuana. And this question is from Al Christensen. Legislators continue to try to modify the will of the people regarding IM 26 and Amendment A, now again being prepared for resubmission. Can you describe what you are trying to do in peer now regarding medicinal and recreational marijuana. And this is open to the all legislators. Representative Tim Goodwin, District 30. Uh, I am 26 passed, uh, as everybody knows, like 75, 76% of the vote. And so we are honoring the will of the people. Department of Health uh, wrote the rules for it that go along with it, I believe it was 144 pages, and we now are trying to get it so that it's palatable for everyone. I'll just give you one example. There was, uh, we had a bill on if we should be able to home grow or not. Uh, if you could, how many plants could a person have in their own house? I mean, the argument was, is there any other medicine? Because remember, medicinal marijuana is medicine that you can grow at home, that you can make yourself, and the answer is no. And then law enforcement came out and said they were against home grow. And so I'm going to vote every time for law enforcement. If they say they can't enforce it and not to do it, I'm on law enforcement side. But that's just one example. But we're trying to do our best to implement the will of the people. We're just getting the rules straightened out. Thank you, Representative Goodwin. Good morning, I'm Mike Diedrich, Senator for District 34. I didn't participate, I did not participate in the summer study committees that looked at both recreational and medicinal 
uh, but I did follow it closely. And we had well over 30 bills, probably closer to 50 bills in this session to make tweaks in the law. And some, most of them are come from the committee that really studied it. And some of them come from uh, people that were on the committee, but their concepts weren't accepted by the committee. So they're, they have the right to go ahead and offer that proposal to the full legislature for consideration. The overriding concept that I get from listening to all of this and reading all of that is the IM26 was drafted by an out-of-state organization and there are a lot of minor tweaks that need, that need to be or should be considered to be made to make that fit South Dakota. And so I, I don't think it's an attack. I don't consider it an attack on the people's will. Uh, the, the medicinal cannabis is moving forward and with the intent to keep it regulated in the manner that, that the proposed initiated measure uh, provided as well as maybe tweak a few things in that area. The recreational marijuana side, as you know, the court struck that down and there is a bill to uh, provide a version of recreational marijuana. I haven't seen that. That's, I don't know that that's on the Senate side or not. But the things that you've been hearing up to this point are not <coughs> things that are saying we don't trust what the people voted on. They're, they are things that are saying we accept what was voted on, but we need to make it work for South Dakota. And we need to have, if, if it's going to be an industry, it needs to be well regulated in a way that the people who are in the industry ha can make their investments or their decisions based on a good structure for uh, that industry and and also for those who may uh, need to participate in, from the medical cannabis side. So I don't see them as an attack. I see them more as trying to make it better for South Dakotans. Uh, Mike Derby, State Representative, District 34. I think some of you have heard this from me before, but uh, I try and look at this type of legislation through the lens of a business person and how it's going to be handled. It's a new industry. We understand how the vote went. We understand what the South Dakota Supreme Court did. The conundrum is it's still illegal federally, and that's, that's the conundrum. So if it's going to be legal in South Dakota, I want it to be... Uh, regulated, promulgate the rules, make sure it's safe, kept out of the hands of children, eliminate the black market as much as we possibly can. And so I look at all these bills, and I was on the summer study session. The Senate bills are the ones that came out of that session. Um, I look at it, how are we going to provide this new product throughout the state of South Dakota and keep control of it? And I continue to look at it that way, so I'll be in favor of some of them, against some of them. Uh, it all depends on how this gets handled as it gets rolled out. Thank you. Senator Helene Duhamel, District 32, Rapid City. I, too, spent many weeks this past summer working on the committees for marijuana. 95 sections that almost no one read beforehand, written by the industry for the industry. So as has been explained, we're trying to make the necessary changes to make it work in South Dakota. One particular subject that came out of the summer study that we had extreme difficulty getting out of the Senate, Senate Bill 20. This was the medical purpose defense. After the fact, I could allege I could have had a medical card. You guys will be seeing that over in the house next. So as a summer study, we agreed, once the program is up and running, the cards are available, you have to follow the process. You have to see the doctor, you have to get the card, then you go to the dispensary. But this medical purpose defense would be available for those who just didn't get around to it or for whatever reason after the fact could allege that my knee hurts, my back hurts, whatever the case, pain is extraordinary, I could have had a medical card. To us, in the summer study, the majority, we thought that makes sense. But believe it or not, that was highly debated and really hard to get out of the Senate. So I'm just giving you an example of some of those things that we're trying to do. We're trying to make it better. We're trying to make sure it works for South Dakota. We want people to follow the rules 
and that's kind of how that happened. Thank you. Thank you, legislators, for your responses to that. Uh, moving on to a more timely question from Kurt Pokart. Uh, in honor of tomorrow's Super Bowl game, this question relates to sports wagering. There is a pending resolution, this is Senate Joint Resolution 502, which would allow voters to decide whether sports wagering should be expanded beyond its current status of being legal only if the wager is placed inside the city limits of Deadwood. What is your position on this issue and how are you betting on its potential passage? Uh, Tim Goodwin, District 30. Well, we had the, we had a bill on that too in the House. It wasn't just a resolution, so we've already we've already acted on it. So anyway, on that, the argument is uh, when we passed uh, sports betting, it had to be within the city limits of Deadwood. The argument is if you have a kiosk at a bar or a restaurant, some other place, Woonsocket, South Dakota, and they place a bet there, and the bet is electronically transferred into a casino in Deadwood, is it actually in Deadwood? Now that's the argument. Uh, the other side of it is, if you place the wager that, uh, at the, whatever, the bar and wound socket, the wound socket takes no, uh, gets no outcome of the game. They, they take no risk, they have no outcome. They're just having a kiosk there that electronically transfers into the, into the whatever casino it's going to on Deadwood. So what you have to decide, is that, within, is that constitutionally within the law or if it's not? Uh, it came before the House, I can't remember what day it was, one day last week. And it was defeated, so it's it's it didn't make it through. So it's it's a dead issue. Thank you, Representative. Good one. Good morning, Jess Olson, District Thirty Four. So I think it's always concerning when we want to make a change to the Constitution, but what this bill does is just simply put it to the voters to see if they want to make a change to the Constitution. And so I think that that is something where I'm, I'm not concerned about limiting it. We do a lot of geofencing, so if you, it allows Deadwood to continue to be relevant in the 21st century, compete with other places. We have a lot of people from across our own state that come to Deadwood to enjoy that. Um, so I think it's worth discussing and having that broader discussion, so I'll be in favor of it. Thank you. Helene Duhamel again. I'll tell you, this is a tough one. Um, the people in eastern South Dakota, in particular in the Senate, uh, very much supported this. They said people could go across the state lines and do over lunch, and they're able to um, do sports wagering in their vehicles or in bars. And so they think you know, it's, it's a really unfair thing that they don't have the opportunity to do this. Um, then there's also that thought um, that this is something that would be available to anyone, anywhere in the state, and um, uh, people worry about uh, the availability of that's wagering from your you know, phone and your device and stuff. So this was a really hard one. It did emerge from the Senate, and it will be moving over to the House, and uh, it is just, just exactly what Representative Olson said. You would be able to vote on this the next time around on the ballot. So it would be an opportunity for the public to decide if you want this. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Senator Julie Freimuller from District 30, and I had a couple of different concerns with this one as well, but the point is, is do you have the freedom to gamble or not? The point is they were already gambling in other areas, I guess, using it. Um, doing it anyway, some of the negatives are, will it help, will it make people even more married to their phones and their electronics and get so hooked on it that they can't get away from it? But I think the big thing for me was, um, there's, there's certain bills that I've seen over the years where I'll take the conservation districts. They wanted to, um, take the 69 conservation districts and put it into 66. And they wanted to bypass the process of getting all the signatures because that takes time. 
but it also takes time, so, so you can go through the legislature and get it put on the ballot, and it's much easier. Um, or you as a, as a group, as the gaming industry, need to go out and get all the signatures yourself. I've, I've seen it go both ways. Um, I don't think it's right when we do it for the government that they can just bypass getting all the signatures because it's easier for them then. And, and, we're, and you, if you understand what I'm saying, um, we just put it on the ballot and you don't have to get, go out and get the 18,000 signatures that you need. But the private industry would have to go out and get the 18,000 signatures that you need to get it on the ballot. So that was one of the things that I also weighed when I voted. I, I think it's the best decision made for by the people. Everybody should get to vote on this. And I also have concerns with it being in our Constitution, too. So, But anyway, it's, it's also about freedom to do what you want to do. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Frommuller. And this will be our last response to this question. We'll move on. Uh, Mike Diedrich, District 34, Senate. Good question and, and good responses. Yeah, but Super Bowl, so if, let's think about Super Bowl for a minute. And both the Rams and the Bengals have South Dakota residents, South Dakota players on their teams this year, which is kind of fun. We have Riley Reif, Reif or Reif, who is an offensive lineman. He's from Parkston, South Dakota. He plays on the Bengals. And then on the other side, we have uh, Kristen... Rosenbaum, for, he was a SDSU uh, football player who was a special teams player. So when you're watching the game, sometimes it helps if you know someone on the team is from South Dakota. This year we have someone on each team from South Dakota, and I think that's pretty cool. Thank you for bringing that back home, Senator Eater. Appreciate it. <laughs> um, this question was directed towards Taffy Howard and Phil Jensen. Uh, who are not present today. However, uh, of course, any lawmaker is invited to answer. Uh, this question is regarding Senate Bill 97, authorize the Board of Regents to acquire the incubator at South Dakota School of Mines and Technology. What is your position on SB 97 and explain the reason for your position? Representative Chris Johnson, District 32, thank you for the question. Uh, this is a uh, bill that I carried last year, and the big opposition to it in appropriations last year was that it wasn't on the priority list for the Board of Regents. Now it is. Uh, this is very uh, badly needed. Uh, it's an, a building that used to be occupied by Elevate Rapid City in part, and uh, now that building is on the campus, it's available, it makes sense to, to purchase that building. School of Mines needs research and development space to continue allowing its students uh, to uh, do the important work that they do, not only uh, pre-grad but post-grad, and, uh, and it just makes total sense for, uh, for us to allow them to absorb that building into their campus, and I see no downside to it at all. Uh, Tim Goodwin, District 30. Yeah, that building, if nobody knows where it's at, it's right in the middle of campus and is what Elevate used to have. And then Elevate, as you know, moved and they built a brand new building north of the post office. So that building's sitting there now and they'd like to own it. And like uh, Representative Johnson just said, last year we couldn't get it through because the Board of Regents didn't have it on their priority list. So now they do have it on their priority list. We tried like heck to get it in the governor's budget because that's a path of least resistance is in our budget. It has a lot better chance of getting through. But uh, last year when we were trying to get the uh, science building on campus, that was in the governor's budget. And I think he's not here today. President Rankin was in session every day talking about it and finally got it on the last day. So this just makes sense. It's $5.2 million. Uh, if you know the campus on School of Mines, it's landlocked. It can't expand any place. Uh, this is right in the middle of campus to try to go off campus and build a building. And now when you try to build a building, when do you get it built? You know, materials, I just had a guy call me on the way in here this morning. Uh, the building he was trying to build was up 60% from what his initial bid was. And trying to get the workers, the materials, I see uh, Jim Scalls in the audience, he can probably talk to that more than anybody. So I think if we have a building already built, and it's right in the middle of campus, the campus is landlocked, 
uh, build a new building could be, you know, in the 15 million price range. This one's already there. 5.25 million sounds like a lot of money, but it, it's it's pretty much bargain in this today's standard. So I think we should support it, support it, and get it passed. Thank you. Mike Derby, State Representative, District 34, Rapid City. I'll I'll just do a me too, and I'm in support of this. Thank you. Well, good morning to everybody. My name is Dave Johnson. I'm a state senator from District 33. I am a School of Mines graduate. And I, uh, everybody has explained it pretty well, what's going on here. But I do want to point out that this bill is meeting a lot of resistance, frankly, in the Joint Committee on Appropriations. It's meeting resistance from legislators on, frankly, mostly from the east side of the state. I could use, we could all use, those of us who are in favor of responsible fiscal management could use some notifications from the constituents about how to, uh, that we should be coming out in support of this bill. We can use input from the people in this audience and the, from the people of Western South Dakota who know that this is the right thing to do. I'd like to hear from you and we certainly need your support in the Joint Committee on Appropriations when we decide to vote on this specific bill. So it's Senate Bill 97, is that what it was? So I'd like to hear from you, as would uh, the rest of the folks here from, from the western side of the state. Thank you. We have three questions regarding the um, the SB 157, which is to make an appropriation to game fish and parks to build a shooting range. Um, the question is director, directed towards Senator Julie Fry Mueller, uh, but of course it's open to all the legislators. Please, or 175, is that what I said? I meant to say one. In the old days, I would have just said, I'm pretty sure I said 175, but no, it was me, not you. Thanks, Lynn. Please explain your opposition to funding a shooting range supported by thousands of outdoorsmen and shooters in favor of, a, of three ranchers who factually live 2.5 to 5 miles plus from the shooting range. Thank you, Senator Julie Freimuller. Um, I would disagree with their thousands of people that are in favor of it. There were a handful there that were for it. A lot, there was quite a few of them actually from the middle of the state and the eastern part of the state supportive of something that directly affected private property owners in Meade County, right next to the Pennington County line. Um, there were, I think, five opponents. I think there was four, four or five there, maybe, I think maybe four there and one on, on the screen, uh, but could have been five there. Rainbow Bible Camp was one of them. They have a business, and it is close to it, and they host events on the weekends, and they have people come from 20 states to enjoy what they have as, as a business and a sharing of the Bible and it would negatively affect them and their business. The landowners adjacent to that um, also are concerned about their quality of life and gunshots going off seven days a week. And they're planning eight to four, I believe, in the fall and winter months, and maybe seven to seven in the summer months. And even on the weekends, how would you guys feel? I mean, and they talk, and I, and I believe in your personal property rights, and they said, well, what about the property rights of the person who wanted to sell the 400 acres? Well, he had just recently bought it and was already in a contract to, to give it to somebody else or have somebody else buy it so they can sell it to GF&P. And so that person didn't have that land so long they were married to it. That was 400 acres. And it won't negatively affect their quality of life, but if you can you imagine living close to a place where there's it's like Beretta Road 
where the gunshots are going off all the time. And I don't believe people, and some of them went back to like the 1800s, they said, it's like it's been in their, in their families forever. Um, and why would we ruin their quality of life? Why would we? For a gun range, for people so they can come from all over. And I understand also there's, they talked about three or four different gun ranges maybe already in the Meade County area that aren't really even being utilized. And then they guaranteed it would be totally safe, totally safe. Nobody can guarantee a gun range will be totally safe. How will the cows know to move? I mean, they were concerned about their, their livestock too, or if their kids are out riding horses, if somebody would miss fire. Also, there was talk that they were looking for the National Guard to do all the dirt work, and it was millions of dollars. The National Guard, I talked to somebody yesterday, that's not what they do. And even if they were considering it, it could take up to two to three years to approve something like that. So just ask yourself, would you want those of us who don't live there, would you want somebody who lived in Pierre, South Dakota, living there saying, I want this gun range so that we can bring our families out to sh practice and shoot for a weekend or a couple times, and it's gonna ruin your quality of life forever for their convenience. And I, I absolutely felt more compassion and the, and the communication between GF and P with these landowners, they were so documented with their time frame of when they were and were not informed on anything, they did an excellent job presenting their case. An excellent job. So, and I should let you know, we, we are gun people, our family is. I, I mentioned in the committee hearing, our six-year-old granddaughter has been shooting for a couple years already, which kind of concerned me, but she has been. Um, Senator, so could you I'm please not, conclude your remarks? Okay, Thank so I'm you. not anti-gun, and I'm, and I'm not anti-gun range. I am not for where they are putting it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Dave Johnson again. Uh, I have the greatest respect for the senator who just spoke, but there are just some things that are just not factual here. Seven days a week of gun shooting? No. Thousands of people in favor? That's probably not true. It's more like tens of thousands that are in favor of this range. There are no other gun ranges in the area, folks. That's also a miss. Uh, it's a little bit of misinformation from the opponents. There, there are no other gun ranges in the area. I'm a former director of the Rapid City Trap Club, and we enthusiastically support this gun range. We're not, it, it's not like this is a, comp, a competitive range for, for the Rapid City Trap Club, which is the only range, frankly, within reasonable distance of this. There are no safety concerns in this. This is, uh, this is an effort that has been studied by tens of thousands of hours, and there are two gun ranges across the country that have already laid the guidelines down for building a safe range. But really, let's go back to personal property rights. It doesn't matter who owns property or when they bought the property or how they bought the property. We're in the United States of America. Do, we, do you have property rights? What was it, two years ago that we had a bill, a very controversial bill, where Game Fish and Parks personnel could not enter your property without permission? Even if they uh, were suspicious that maybe something was going on in as far as game or hunting, this legislature said, no way. Mr. Game Fish and Parks, man, you can't go into that property without permission because we respect private property rights in South Dakota. This is the purest example of property rights and exercising of property rights. This is a private property owner who wishes to do something with his 440 acres. Who are we to say that you can't exercise your rights as an American citizen with your property? There are no violations of law there are no violations of, of, of the property rights of any of the neighboring property owners. 
this is this is a situation where we need to stand up. We don't want to to be balanced. Okay, we will ex exercise private property rights in this case, but we won't in this case. So again, with all respect, I just I just disagree, and I think we need to talk about the facts. And this is my bill. Thank you, Representative Tim Goodwin, District Thirty. Just a few things on this bill. It's one of the best bills I think we have before us this year. It's a, it's, it's a combined partnership, public partnership. The cost to the state's 2.5 million. The 7.5 million is, uh, is from the private sector or game fishing parks that they've already had the money for. So what we need to do when we're sitting here with all, when we're drunk and all this federal money that got forced on us, we can't send it back. We gotta spend it wisely and we gotta do it on one-time expenses. We can't have it ongoing. This is a one-time expense to put a world-class range nine miles north of the Flying J. It crosses from Pennington County into Meade County. Uh, the Bible ran uh, ranch, that, the horse Bible ranch that's by there, uh, testified when it came before the house. They're four and a half miles north of the range. Four and a half miles north. If you look, if you drive that Flying J Road north, it goes down, and then it goes up a big hill. The chances of them hearing anything are just about nil. It would have to be a strong southerly wind on a perfect day. Also, Watertown has a range right next to town. I'm from Watertown originally. I talked to some of my friends there. I talked to legislators in Watertown. There isn't one complaint about that range. They have it baffled. They have it set up right. And there, is, there are zero complaints. The people in Watertown love it. They use it. Uh, this is a world-class range. We could have all kinds of shooting events, but it's also for the local people, for 4-H'ers, FFA'ers, mentored hunters that could go out there and fire. I heard Beretta Road mentioned earlier. That's where people go fire in the Black Hills. Well, they, they go fire, they leave all kinds of trash, they saw down trees, they do all that kind of stuff, but they don't have another place to go to. So if we had a, if we had a set range, ma'am, please let me talk. Uh, so if they had a set range where they could go to and have it organized, safe firing, I, that's what we need. And the, and the notion that it's unsafe, show me one cow, show me one incident where somebody got shot by a stray bullet from a range. Show me one in the history of South Dakota. It's totally safe, it's buffered, there is no stray bullets going anything. They even have bu uh, buffers above it. If you wanted to tr shoot, you know, if you had some maniac in there that wanted to do tr uh, problems, it would be very, very difficult to do. So this, I think, is one of the better bills we have before us this year. Uh, 10 million expenditure, 2.5 by the state. It's a partnership. We need to do whatever we can to get this passed. Thank you. Senator Julie Freimuller, I would encourage all of you to go listen to the testimony on this bill. It was on Thursday morning at 10 o'clock, um, and there was talk from the people that there are like four existing um, gun shooting ranges that are, no, are not being utilized in the Meade County area. Otherwise, how would I know that if it wasn't said there? Um, and then this bill was already killed in the House, and this is a redo on the Senate side. So I just wanted to clarify, but if you want to know what was said at the committee hearing and, and all the concerns, please listen to the testimony, proponent, opponent, and all the discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Farmer. Um, sir, I Representative Goodwell, I can't, I, I, I'm not going to turn this. Please let me speak. You can't come back up if we're going to Please let me speak. The same rules, well, we're I understood. Not, we're that was my fault. I understand. We're not having a debate. We are not having a debate. Well, I agree. Don't let one happen. Thank you. As was noted, there will be no, this is not a committee hearing, there will not be any rebuttal. I understand that there will be opportunities where ideas will come to your mind that you did not address the first time. I'm sorry, but as Representative Goodwood said, this is not going to be a debate. This is a time to answer questions from the audience. So please forgive me for letting that happen. It will not happen again. Our next question is referencing House Bill 1005. Why do the legislators continue to try to pass bills that target transgender kids? A specific example is HB 1005, which would prohibit transgender students from using multi-occupancy public school facilities consistent with their gender identity. This question is from Muffy Musso.
Good morning. Good morning, Jess Wilson, District 34. So on this particular bill, 1005, that did get deferred to the 41st day. What that means is that will, that's at the end of session. So there's not 41 days in session. So that, that killed this bill. And so the judiciary, even with members of that committee bringing this forward, um, chose to kill this bill. And I think it is disappointing for individuals in this state to feel like they're being targeted. You've heard even statements from our governor's staff talking about terrorism. And no US citizen should be called a terrorist, no matter what, in these kinds of social constructs. So I think that we do need to be very mindful. If we have concerns, how we're having that discourse and how we're doing that, because that's, that is not okay. And so at least on this one, you did see the judiciary vote this down. Uh, Mike, <clears throat> Mike Diedrich, District 34. I, I serve on the Judiciary Committee that had the hearing on that, as Senator Drew, Drew Hamill also does. We get, it was a long hearing. I mean, it, it took an entire meeting, a uh, lot of, lot of uh, discussion. The goal, the stated goal was we want to protect our kids from sexual predators in the schools. The solution they proposed had it really didn't have anything to do with that because there wasn't any evidence or proof of any sexual predators in our school system that were gender based or uh, uh, biologically male or biological female who identified with the other gender. Nothing to do with that. So the goal is an admirable goal. Yes, we want to keep our kids safe in schools. The fact is, you know, you go into a school. You have to check in at the front. You have to check in before you can get in. They have the security. They have the cameras. We don't have that assault problem in South Dakota. And the solution was, uh, didn't fit what the problem was they wanted to solve. And so it, after a lot of hearing from both sides, uh, our committee concluded six to one, I believe it was, that, that that's an admirable effort to protect our kids, but this method of, of doing it was not fair and not effective for South Dakota. Senator Julie Fry Mueller, I was a, a co-sponsor or a sponsor for this bill. Um, it had nothing to do with anything other than making sure every child is safe in a bathroom or in a shower. That's what it had to do with, and it started because of the Vermilion School District and what they had done, and because it, they were trying to say it's local control, it's not, because those schools all compete against each other, so there needed to be some baseline of how this was gonna be addressed. So if you were playing basketball, we only had one gender in the in the girl shower and one ge gender in the in the boys shower that's what it was about and it was about safety and privacy for everyone and it, and i think it was a good bill it didn't target anybody it wasn't saying oh you can't do this or that it's just recognizing science and what your gender is and respecting the privacy of all students because there's other students who don't have some of these issues that I feel really bad for these other kids having, but why should their privacy and be just not even, not, their thoughts on their privacy and the, not be considered? I mean, why is it, and they've expressed, they expressly said many times, it's the majority is who you need to take care of. The other ones we can make accommodations for. Thank you. Helene Duhamel, Rapid City, also serve on the Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, we took two hours to hear this bill. We let everyone have their say, and in many ways it was like litigating exactly what happened in Vermilion. Almost all testimony pro and con from Vermilion. And we ended up thinking, you know, we're not a school board. Do we want school boards? Are these local decisions? If people in Vermilion 
dislike this decision, they'll vote that school board out. But if you read this bill closely, it wanted to make a fix for the entire state of South Dakota. In many places, there are no problems. These are older schools. You would have had to build a single room, shower, and bathroom. This was something that we just did not think was appropriate at this time. We think this, you know, they're not asking the legislature to be a school board. That's kind of how we decided on this issue. We'll have one more response and then we'll move on to another subject. Uh, Dave Johnson, hey, do you mind rereading the question, please? Referencing House Bill 1005. Why do legislators continue to try to pass bills that target tra target? Stop. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's the question that I want to address. In the state of South Dakota, every single legislator has every single right to bring any single bill that they want to bring. We have no control of that, and frankly, I don't think anybody in this room wants to have control over a legislator, an elected representative of the people. If they want to bring a bill, they have that right. Keep in mind that it has to go through six grueling steps to become law. This is an example of a legislator exercising his right in what he feels is speaking on behalf of his constituency. And let's keep in mind that it failed. It's dead, and that is the process. So that's the answer. We're allowed to bring any bills that we want. I didn't have any, um, any effect on this. It never came before me. But let's recognize the right of legislators who you people elect to bring any bill that they want and that it has to have a fair hearing. So, thank you. Thank you, Senator Johnson. This next question addresses Senate Bill 53, which is a, a workforce housing bill. It's directed towards Senator Diedrich and the entire legislative uh, body present here. Housing is one of the most critical issues in this state. What is the status of SB 53, which will help increase the workforce housing supply across the state? How does this help Rapid City? Senator Diedrich, District 34, thank you for that question. I mean, that's a great question, and, and actually I have my bill with my notes written on it. It's, it's the result of a long process that we did as a, as a legislative summer study. We crisscrossed the state. We talked to developers. We talked to school boards. We talked to communities. We talked to economic development people. We talked to home builders and contractors on how do we help address our housing shortage in South Dakota. We heard lots of th threads that went through that. Um, one of them was the Housing Opportunity Fund is, is a state program that uh, provides low interest loans for low income and moderate income and affordable housing. We also heard the other theme that was strong was there's a need for housing for economic that's tied to economic development projects. The end result was we have $200 million, you know, catch your breath, $200 million of funds that may be appropriated by the state. $100 million of that would be through the government, uh, the governor's office of economic development, and that would, that would go through the local infrastructure improvement program, the LIP program. That is a program to help developments of housing necessary f that are related to economic development projects. The other 100 million would go into the Housing Opportunity Fund, and that would be, oh, and the first one would be a grant program, a grant for that. The second one would be to the Housing Opportunity Fund for 100 million, that would be for the low and moderate income that's affordable housing. That would be a revolving loan fund for South Dakota. The need for housing is so broad in South Dakota. I mean, it ranges from small communities who need two or four duplexes so that they can recruit and keep teachers or healthcare workers or 
clergy uh, or whatever it might be. They, and, but other communities need a larger because they may have an industry in their community. So the way it works is it's a, it's a leverage plan, $200 million to be appropriated by the state uh, to, in order to get it. It would take one a match, a one-to-one -one match by the local government that's involved with it, or tribal government, or county, or economic development foundation, and also the developer. So it turns it into $600 million worth of resources for the infrastructure. The cost, the, the development of infrastructure for housing is expensive, a lot of upfront costs, takes a while for the buildings to come out of the ground, and that's, and, and that's so they're paying property taxes and, and working with debt up to that point. The intent is to incentivize the preparation of the infrastructure so that we can build this housing that we need of all forms throughout South Dakota. Thank you, Senator Dietrich. Any more comments on SB 53, make an appropriation, increase workforce housing? Just a me too, and just to add just a couple of things. Tim Goodwin, uh, uh, representative for District 30. You know, every place you go, you see help wanted signs. There are always going to be help wanted signs until we have places for them to live. That you got to fix that first. In the state, we're estimated to be 10,000 houses short, housing units short. So we have to do something. I think everybody in the legislature is trying to do their best. The governor's trying. And we got to come up with some remedy for this. And if we can help the private sector is the driving engine there. And if you drive around Rapids Theory, the Black Hills, you can see all the housing units, apartments going up, but anything we can do to help this out, because we are in a crisis, 10,000 units short in the state is, is a crisis. Thank you, Representative Goodwin. And to add a little color to the Me Too's, in a committee, when everyone before you has spoken all the good points you are also going to bring, but you still want to show your support, it's common for a, a participant or witness in the community to sit and say, to declare who they are and say, Me Too. Yeah, so a lot of these bills, as has been noted, the, the process can be convoluted. Uh, and many of these bills that, were, that address spending first go through subcommittees or another committee before they make it to the Joint Committee on Appropriations. And this bill has just now been referred to the Joint Committee on Appropriations and is awaiting its hearing there, for those of you keeping score at home. Um, all right, legislators, you're going to have to follow me close on this one. This comes as an online submission from Kirsten Livermont. Some South Dakota representatives proposed increasing graduation requirements to two government slash civics courses, and yet they limit student participation in the governmental process. For instance, Representative Sue Peterson's HB 1310, which authorizes parental review of instructional and curricular materials. What are representatives proposing be taught during that additional course not outlined in the current standards? And for clarity, I believe this extra course is proposed in HB 1265. So a bit of a crossover question here. Good morning, Jess Wilson, District 34. So on this bill, you'll see that it's up in house education. It has not had a hearing yet. So if you have concerns or questions about this bill, it's important to reach out to those specific committee members at this time, just from a process standpoint. One thing from having served on the education committee that is very, there are two points that we need to look at. Number one, the state does not set curriculum. This is an important distinction. We as a legislature are charged with having a public education system and funding that education system. But we have had long discussion over many years to, in, to maintain local control. That means your local school board, at the closest level to you as the taxpayer, the parent, the constituent, that school board chooses the curriculum. That way, if you have a problem with it, you can go to them. When we get into the question of state check setting curriculum, not everything is the right fit for every school district, and that's why over many, many years we have maintained that distinction. So I think that you want to, the other question on this is authorized parental review of instruction and curriculum material. Every parent has that opportunity now. You can do that at the local level, at the closest level to you. 
And so I don't know that, I always ask that question first, whenever we look at a bill, does this have to be law? Is it already a policy? Or is this just a solution looking for a problem? And I would say this one probably falls into that latter category. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Olson and the other takers. Sticking on the education side, this question is from Jim Cunningham. We continue to talk about low teacher pay in South Dakota. I thought this was fixed with the half penny sales tax. Um, so I guess the question is why are we still, and it is addressing House Bill 1080, which prolongs requirements for increasing teacher compensation. This bill started on the House side and um, was amended a couple times uh, before passing uh, the House Representative 65 to 1. Uh, it then went to Senate Education where it passed and is awaiting House the Senate floor. All right, so the great mystery of our time is the school funding formula. <laughs> so um, what this bill did, and that is a great question. We thought we, we it, what that half penny sales tax did was increase tax revenue directed towards, I hope I'm saying this right, teacher pay. And then within the constructs of that, it is, there's a, there's a portion of what you have to put as a school district towards your teacher pay to meet a base teacher pay. So this is an ongoing thing. This isn't just we increase it one time. Your sales tax, you pay that every day on different things that you buy. And every year we have teachers we have to pay. So it's just like salaries or any other ongoing expense, that's why this isn't like you have a tax one year and then it goes away. Um, and so I, that would be my simplest answer to that question. I hope that makes sense. But we have to prolong the, the ability to use that and to look at continuing to have school districts apply that added tax that you and I pay specifically to teachers and not all other areas of their budget. Thank you, uh, Mike Derby, State Representative, District 34. Uh, this specific bill uh, was really to move the dates out a couple more years so that we look at it, the, the 2017 number for the baseline. So this was kind of a mechanics bill to allow us to continue to look at it. So I just wanted to clarify that, thanks. We're fighting for the mic up here. Uh, Tim Goodwin, District 30. Just to talk in general uh, what, the, what we're doing in that this year is the governor proposed 6%. Uh, by statute, it's, uh, teachers get a 3% raise or whatever the CPI is, Consumer Price Index. Uh, last year it was 2%. And so there is automatic in the codified law that they get a raise every year, 3% or the Consumer Price Index, whichever is less. So this year the governor came out ahead of it and her budget proposed a 6% raise. That's a one-time deal, it's not, it'll go back to codified law after this year, but with some of the extra money and the revenues that are coming in from the state, she wanted to give the teachers and all state employees, it's not just teachers, a bump. Thank you. Chris Johnson, Representative District 32, I would just add to those comments, I agree with the previous comments, but when that half cent sales tax was passed, the, the one of the big reasons why they got support for it was that it was supposed to try, even though the state cannot directly instruct the use of that money from sales tax to be put towards teacher pay, it was to try to put a little bit of teeth into there to, to ensure that teacher pay got addressed as part of that funding. And with the sunset that was on that, we need to extend that. If we didn't extend that, 
uh, you know, uh, organizations, schools could be free or, you know, anybody, any uh, government entity that receives that funding could be free to use it for whatever they wanted to and not feel restricted to put it towards teacher pay. So this is a way of continuing to address teacher pay uh, as long as that half cent sales tax remains on the books. Thank you. Since it seemed popular, I would allow a couple more responses if anyone has one. Well, we have a follow-up which um, may, uh, which touches on a, sim on a similar subject and not addressing any particular legislation, addressing more the, the state budget in general. Uh, with recent data coming out indicating the inflation rate is running at 7.5%, is there any discussion about if the proposed 6% increase to schools health care providers and state employees is still the right amount. Well, thank you for the question. I don't even know how to begin to answer that. Every single day in the Joint Committee Appropriations, we discuss what is the appropriate amount where is inflation going to be tomorrow? Where is inflation going to be next year? What are the revenue forecasts that are coming out Monday or Tuesday of next week? What are they going to be? How, how does inflation affect revenue projections? How does, rev, how does inflation affect sales tax revenue? How does it affect property taxes? I think we all have seen that. How do you answer, how do you project into the future. You know, the, the Senate or the uh, Joint Committee on Appropriations held a two hour hearing where we had two economists uh, come to us from, from online and they spoke to us for two hours and these were economists, highly educated professors of, of the economy and they were point counterpoint. That's, okay, so we came away from that scratching our head more than when we went in there. There is no way. I don't know the way. Uh, nobody has ever figured it out. What economists do you want to use? They all have different opinions. I just don't know how to answer that question, except that nobody knows. What is the right number? It's, it's a matter of throwing a dart against the wall and seeing where it sticks, frankly. And all we can do is try to be conservative in our estimates of what the revenue is going to be and what inflation is going to be next year. And uh, thankfully, we have about 18 people in Joint Committee on Appropriations who are all concerned and trying to do their best. So again, I'd like to, I'd like to hear from, from constituents. I, I really do like and enjoy that, you know, texting or voicemail because I've got over 5,000 emails that I haven't gotten to yet. So <laughs> it's going to be difficult for me to read email. I just tell you that because I do try. But email is not the way to get a hold of me, texting or telephone. And I've never made a secret, 2090555. I have never made a secret of my cell phone number. So give me a call or write me a text. Just don't send me an email. Chris Johnson, District 32 representative. would like to agree completely with the previous speaker, my brother Johnson down there on the medium left. Uh, <laughs> I, I got beat out on the far left for a while, but uh, <laughs> I got beat out on the physically, far left for a while. But, physically uh, Senator, located. Senator Prime Mueller said she had to go back to work, so now I'm on the far right again. So um, I would just add to that that, you know, this is really a question that absolutely has to do with where is inflation going. Two years ago, if we would have proposed a 6% increase for the big three, we call it, uh, people would have just had their hair on fire over, uh, well, not me, but but anybody who had hair would have had their hair on fire over 6%. Now we're talking about is 6% enough to keep up with inflation. Just the other day we heard the new revised inflationary figures are 7.5%. I think this question, uh, and I am not one to pass the buck where it is not time for us to pass the buck, but this question is better directed to your Congress and the President of the United States as to where inflation is gonna be by the time this all shakes out. <laughs> and we are simply responding to the policies that are put forth by the federal government right now when it comes to what in, is causing the inflation in South Dakota right now. We're doing the best we can to address it, but as Senator Johnson said, 
six months down the road, how do we know where inflation is going to be? We're doing the best we can. Thank you. The, the, so what you're hearing about is the revenue projections will be determined by the appropriations committees this coming week. When they, they create those projections, then they base the entire budget off those projections of revenue. It's a challenge. We know it's a challenge because of inflation. We, what's the impact of inflation on agriculture? You know, their supplies have gone up, their supply costs have increased, their transportation costs have increased. They're going to have a lot of money in their, in their product and in their, in their cattle. And, but we don't know what the market will be for that. Are they going to take a hit? Are they going to be held whole? Are they going to, are they going to make, generate some profit revenue? We look at how, what are we spending our money on? The, the general philosophy of the legislature is one-time monies, not ongoing programs that require future funding because we don't know what the future is. We have to be thoughtful. We have to make sure we have money in reserve for the future, for the things that we need to fund, that we have to fund, our education, public safety, health care. But we also have to ensure that we optimize the revenues that are available for us. But we do not want, we cannot get into a position where we have built in too many things into the base budget and the revenue projections will change every year that may not provide us the revenues to fund those. Then, then you move into the cutting programs. And yes, there are programs that, a lot of programs that are being looked at and hard looked at. Do we need them still? Do we need to fund them at that level? What can we do? Are they duplicative? Do they, are they inefficient? Uh, we continue to do that. But setting the revenue projections this next week is, is just uh, one of the benchmark activities of the legislature because that's where all the budget is based on. And, and, and it's unknown, but we all have an obligation to be good stewards for the future generations of South Dakota and make sure that we spend wisely, save wisely, and invest wisely. Appreciate the input on that one. Um, the next question is in reference to House Bill 1242, which allows for the medical practice based on conscience. And it was directed to Senator Fry Mueller, who if I understand correctly has left. Um, but I would like to open this up to uh, all the legislators here. Uh, regarding HB 1242, what is the litmus test for, quote, basis of conscious, unquote, conscience, unquote, versus opinion bias, prejudice, et cetera? Uh, thank you for the question. This is the first I've seen of it or heard of it, but the litmus test is people sitting right out there. If you want your representative or senator to vote a certain way on this, then you better get a hold of them and let them know that you're the litmus test. We do represent you. If this fails, it's because the people have spoken through their legislature. If it passes, it's because the people have not spoken or spoken in favor of this legislation. I'm here to represent you. If you want, if you like this bill, if you don't like this bill, get a hold of me. I think I mentioned my phone number earlier. That truly is the litmus test in the United States of America. So get out there and vote and get a hold of your legislator. Let us know what you want. Since this is a House bill, I haven't really examined it very closely because it has a lot of steps to get through before it gets to the Senate, and we're in the Senate side. We're busy going through all our steps to get things to the House side or not get them there. It depends on your view. So medical conscience is really, that's a really short bill. I mean, that's very short language with probably major implications. It gets to the core of if I 
if I'm, I'll use right to life, pro-life as an example. If I'm pro-life and I'm licensed as a practitioner, I don't want to work in an area or a department or a clinic that may do things contrary to my, my conscience, my strongly held beliefs regarding uh, the preservation of life. And so this bill says that people who have that have the right to say, I don't want to. I'm, I don't want to do this job. But the implications that, are, that you don't see in a couple sentences is, are typically related to if they're in, working in a zone, they should have the ability to let their supervisor know, or they ha should have the ability to maybe change their job or their job description or their, their uh, certifications so that they can work in an area where it's not an issue. If there's adequate staffing in an area and, and, the, and a staff member says, I, can't, I just can't do this, and, and that can be backfilled by that clinic or that physician's office, other people, so they can take care of the patient you know, that's a reasonable request, I believe. But if it gets to the point where the patient, the best, you know, the best interest of the patient is the core of health care. And if it happened to be into a, a situation where a patient needed care and an essential caregiver in that pr health care provider team insisted on dropping at that point, then it becomes an ethical question of, how do you mitigate that either? How do you, how do you take care of the patient and still respect that caregiver's wish? And, and you know, to me, the bottom line is first serve the patient and then deal, if, and if you can't deal with it at that moment, then you can deal with it separately. So there's a lot, of mo lot more implication to that than just a couple sentences. And I look forward to hearing the debate if it, if it comes to our side. And there's probably a similar bill like that on the Senate side, but I think it will have more language. Representative Chris Johnson again, District 32. Uh, this has not been vetted, obviously, it's, uh, it, but we have had some good discussion on it. And while I am normally in favor of a lot of the conscience bills, uh, I voted in favor of a conscience bill that uh, released somebody from a uh, do not compete uh, contract if the reason they had to leave was a matter of their conscience, and I, I was in favor of that. The problem I have with this bill, just on reading it, and uh, if you read that line, a medical practitioner has the right to practice in such a manner that the practitioner deems is in the best interest of the practitioner's patient based on the practitioner's conscience. The problem I have with that is it, it really creates almost like a... a uh, health care power of attorney for the practitioner on behalf of the practitioner's patient and it doesn't even say the patient has, uh, has the right to sign off uh, or has the op obligation to sign off on that uh, power of attorney so I think uh, on the surface this has real problems for me and it should have problems for anybody on both sides of it you know if, if you're okay with a practitioner having a right I don't know if it's under surgery or if you're under anesthesia or whatever saying that in that practitioner's conscience it's okay to do something to you that's based on that person's conscience you know uh, what no matter where you are in the spectrum of conscience that might be a problem for you as a patient unless you've signed off on that so that's where my problem with this uh, comes from just looking at it objectively Hopefully I can wrap this up. Um, again, I would like to hear from you on this. And I think I gave my phone number down, but since we heard from Representative Johnson and Senator Diedrich, I'd like, you to, I'd like to give you their phone numbers as well. So. <laughs> if I recall, uh, Senator Johnson's number is 209-2099. 0555. You said it fast, 209-0555. He appreciates cat gifts also, so lighten his day, maybe by sending one of those. Um, the last question in our queue addresses House Bill 1255, and the question contains uh, some legislative 
uh, jargon that we use at the Capitol called a smokeout. So I will read the definition of a smokeout before we get to the question. A smokeout is invoking Joint Rule 7-7, whereby one third of the members of a house can require a committee to deliver a bill to the full body by the next legislative day. This is a legislative technique used to bring bills that have been killed by a committee to the House floor for discussion. And this question is from Mike Mueller and directed towards Chris Johnson, but of course open to all of our legislators. HB 1255, a smoke out of this bill improves access for citizen input at public meetings. Can you and others speak to the merits of this bill? Thank you. Okay, basically, uh, I'm against smoke outs because I think it goes against the committee process. Every bill gets a fair hearing. It goes before a committee. And we have, what do they say, 500 some bills this year. You know, you're just, you're just delaying stuff by doing this. The committee had it at that time and point, listened to proponent and opponent testimony, and made a decision on it. If you don't like the decision, bring the bill back next year. So I think it's, I just, I'm against smoke outs. I think it goes against the committee process. I think we have a great process in South Dakota where Bill gets a hearing, and so I don't believe in smoke outs. Thank you. Um, I'll add just a little color for me, if I may, and then I'll let you go. Um, so to give the audience uh, the idea of uh, the process here, so this was in uh, House local government where um, the motion to pass failed six to seven, but then the motion to defer to the 41st day was a 12 to one vote, so. Yeah, um, and the 41st day, I don't know if you know, that, uh, Chris Johnson, District 32 again, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, you know, we're, we're dealing with 551 bills this year, so forgive me if I don't remember the exact specifics of this one. So, um, you know, the 41st day alone, a lot of people don't understand what that is, but there is no 41st day in our legislature, so it's in essence killing the bill in committee, okay? And whenever, like if we have a due pass motion and that motion fails, that doesn't mean the bill is killed. We have to get final disposition on the bill. So the 41st day gives it final disposition. Now, I'm okay with smokeouts. It should be used sparingly, and I think it is used sparingly on the floor. What the smokeout does is it, it basically says that if people believe there is more support for a particular bill on the floor than there, that, than there was within that particular committee makeup, or let's just say they believe that the floor uh, uh, represents um, a mindset that was a little bit slanted or, or not well represented according to the body of the house uh, in that committee, they can sm smoke it out. Now you have to have a third of the members of the floor to stand uh, in support of that, if I remember right, uh, on a smoke out, and that's a substantial number of people. It's a, it's a high bar to get over, and it, I think it works pretty well, but sometimes you might be on the other side of this if you really believe in your bill and you think your committee maybe didn't hear all the right testimony, or if, if the makeup of that committee didn't really represent the makeup of the body. And so I'm, I'm in favor of smoke outs, uh, and I do believe they should be used very sparingly. Thank you. Mike Derby, State Representative, District 34. This bill, the heart of the matter, from uh, the way I understand it, has to do with, uh, scroll back up a little, please, Lynn. No, I'm sorry, down, down, down has to do with public comment for a, you see it crossed out, regular meeting. And now the amendment is an official meeting. And so it's, what is a regular meeting? Okay, and will public comment be allowed at? Uh, some people interpret a regular meeting as the monthly regular meetings. That's a regular meeting. Uh, and so public comment's allowed. But there's many meetings that are held outside of regular meetings where public comment is not posted and allowed. That's my understanding and interpretation of it. So they're trying to define and change from regular to official. Thank you. Jess Wilson, District 34. So, um, 
Representative Johnson and I both serve on local government. We were on different sides of this issue, and you could see that it had a lot of debate. I would encourage you to listen to the hearing because it is an, it is an interesting thing. It's a small word change, but it has large implications. And we heard from quite a few um, individuals who work in local government about what it means when you have an official meeting. So official meetings can also be closed meetings, and that's for city safety or security in which there it wouldn't be that. So there, and then sometimes there are special sessions or executive sessions when they're talking about evaluate employee evaluations and things like that. So there are sometimes reasons for those closed meetings and then open meetings. So I would encourage you to first listen to that testimony because that one small word change does have large implications like the previous speaker said. Thank you. I, I, I'm sorry, I can't. I'm s I, I apologize, even without a rebuttal. It was announced earlier, you gotta get your I'm points not across. Rebut. I, I'm not, you, you need to say all your points when you get the first time. I, I apologize, Representative Johnson, my attempt to maintain decorum. And at that, that concludes the questions that we had for today. So I'd like to thank the lawmakers, thank the audience, thank the online participants, thank all the volunteers for participating in the Cracker Barrel today. And uh, please attend the next Cracker Barrel, which will be on February 26th. Thanks. Be safe out there.